Welcome back RP Plus RPU, Dr. James Hoffman here and today we're going to be finishing up our Basics of Physiology series and today we're on part three. If you haven't watched parts one and two yet, you might want to go back and take a look at those as some of the things that we talk about in today's lecture uh, might not make as much sense. So in part one we talked about basic chemical reactions, biomolecules, parts of cells. In part two, we talked about the concept of homeostasis and acute responses versus chronic adaptations, things like that. Today, what we wanna talk about, really, really interesting, basic body systems and some of the structures and functions involved in those body systems. Now, if we take a look at the overview, we're not gonna talk about every single body system, body structure, and every single hormone and crazy thing that we could talk about. We're gonna keep it pretty simple. And really my goal for you for today, if you are not familiar with many of the different body systems and some of the structures and functions of those things, just to get kind of a rudimentary familiarity with some of those things. So if we start talking about the heart, or we talk about you know um, digestive tract, things like that, we have a pretty good fundamental understanding of what those things are. Now, this is more or less meant to get you kind of prepped and familiar with these topics. It's not super in depth, mostly just for you to have a basic understanding before you go on and take some of the more challenging courses later on in exercise physiology, nutrition, and some of the training ones. So more again, kind of to wet your whistle on some of these topics and just make sure we're all up to speed on the same terms. So we're not gonna go over everything possible and we're not gonna go super crazy detail, but we're gonna give a pretty good brief description of all of these things. And hopefully we'll have a pretty good idea of how these all work. All right, let's get started. So the first one today I wanna to talk to you guys about is the cardiovascular system. Most of us are pretty familiar with this. So the cardiovascular system is basically everything pertaining to how blood is exchanged throughout the body. So if we wanna be more specific, we're gonna be talking about the heart, arteries, veins, and different vessels that are carrying oxygenated or deoxygenated blood. Some of it could be full of waste, some of it could be full of nutrients, any and all of those things, right? Anything that is carrying blood from one part of the body to the another, some way, shape, or form, right? So what are some of the primary functions of the cardiovascular system? Well, obviously we need to transport blood, but to be more specific, really what we're trying to do with the cardiovascular system is outlined here on the slide, right? The first one, deliver oxygen to the body tissues. And so in our discussion, we're primarily focused on getting oxygen to the working muscle during exercise, right? That's an obvious one, but it applies to all body tissues as well. We want to deliver energy substrate to tissue. So we're actually going to be circulating things like carbohydrates, amino acids, and some fatty acids in the blood that have to circulate and make their way around the body to be used for energy. We're going to be removing things like carbon dioxide and a lot of metabolic waste that tends to accumulate in certain areas, especially like the muscle tissue. So what you guys will learn later on there are numerous chemical reactions involved in energy breakdown, and a lot of those things result in the accumulation of byproducts. No surprise there, right? We already talked about that a little bit. Well, those byproducts are waste, right? They uh, can sometimes have a potential effect in the body, a positive effect in, in the body, but a lot of times can be negative as well. So the body picks up on that as waste and it has to shuttle it out and either be reprocessed or excreted, right? So the blood is the mechanism in which we generally do that, where we have waste accumulating somewhere, it gets shuttled into the blood, moved into somewhere to be processed and then either excreted or repurposed, right? So we gotta get rid of that carbon dioxide and some waste products. We're gonna be using the blood to regulate acid base balance. So in some cases in exercise, we can actually see really, really large changes in the pH of certain tissues, like the muscle tissues, as a result of working out really, really hard. The blood helps us buffer that out a little bit so that it's not getting this like huge, huge, crazy systemic effect. So the blood kind of helps act as a buffer when we start accumulating really, really high amounts of protons and then our pH goes down, we get acidity. So instead of just having um, total body acidity, the blood helps us manage it and keep more local acidity so we don't have this like systemic nasty pH effect, right? Also really important in transportation of a lot of our different biomolecules. So we already mentioned energy substrates, but one of the big pur uh, purposes of blood, one of the big functions is actually to start transporting some of those chemical messengers throughout the body. Things like hormones and other chemical messengers travel through the bloodstream and actually hit target cells on their surface somewhere else and then can have whatever effect that they're gonna have. And we're actually gonna talk about that a little bit later. And then of course we want to regulate not only fluid balance, but also thermoregulation within the body. So the blood plays a huge role in making sure that our water levels are good and we're also thermoregulating, meaning not getting too hot or not getting too cold under various conditions. So more than just what we generally think, right? Well, usually we think heart, blood, oxygen, 
oxygen, and that's true with a lot of other stuff as well. So let's go on to the next slide. So no surprise here, if you guys have seen a heart before, that's what it looks like, or at least a, a diagram version. So the heart blumps, blumps, is that a new word? I just made that up. A heart pumps blood all throughout the body, right? And we know that the heart is made of several chambers. It has several valves, right? The ones that are most important to us are the four big ones that we like to call the atria and the ventricles. So typically we look at it in this order. So if you look on the slide, the first one says the right atrium, that's RA, receives deoxygenated blood and waste, right? So essentially this is a chamber that receives used blood and kind of fills it up and collects it. Eventually the blood will make its way into the right ventricle, which will pump that deoxygenated blood into the lungs where it can do gas exchange and potentially remove things like carbon dioxide through exhalation. Eventually, that's gonna make its way into the left atrium where that now rich oxygenated blood will be collected and then eventually the left ventricle will be the pumping mechanism that pumps that nice fresh oxygenated blood back throughout the body. So, when we're thinking about these things, we wanna make sure we're clear with some of the terms and most of you who have taken biology or anatomy and physiology or any kind of health sciences classes are probably familiar with this, but it's always good to kind of brush up on it, make sure we're good. So if you look on this next slide, we have some terms, right? We have arteries and veins. So arteries are um, tubules that carry oxygenated blood away from the heart, right? So when we're talking about things that are arteries, arteries are carrying that fresh um, or at least relatively full of oxygen blood to other tissues in the body where they can pick up and use some of that oxygen later on if they need to. Things like skeletal muscle, right? No surprise there. Veins, on the other hand, are carrying deoxygenated blood back towards the heart so that it could be oxygenated again inside the lungs, right? So arteries is fresh oxygenated blood going away from the heart. Veins, deoxygenated blood where the oxygen has been extracted out by the body tissues now needs to be re-energized or refilled with oxygen at the lungs. So if we're looking at it in terms of size, we have arteries being the biggest, generally moving into arterioles, which are smaller vessels, moving into capillaries, which are generally the smallest ones that we're gonna be discussing. And on the other end with veins, we have veins, venules, and venous sinuses. So here's a nice little diagram of kind of what this looks like, and we can see, right, where the heart pumps blood into the lungs, then it pumps that back through the body, and we can see some exchange there with the arteries and veins as the oxygen gets extracted from various parts of the body. So hopefully nothing crazy and new there. Most of us are familiar with this. Let's go on to the next one. So we know that the cardiovascular system plays a huge role in a number of exercise-related tasks. So we know, first off, the cardiovascular system, in conjunction with the muscle system, is very, very much responsible for blood flow distribution. So one of the cool things that happens during exercise is that blood flow actually gets redistributed to working tissues and it actually gets constricted away from non-essential tissues. So we don't just see normal blood flow, right? It doesn't just occur kind of uniformly at all times. What we actually see is once you start exercising and start working certain muscle groups, we actually start to see blood flow preferentially moving towards those working muscles and away from non-working muscles or non-working organs, which is pretty cool. So very, very important for us. We also see the cardiovascular system playing a role in respiration. Now this occurs through a number of different mechanisms. The two that we're really in, uh, kind of concerning ourselves with is pH balance and what I've listed as VO2 diff, right? And which is actually the arterial venous, sometimes called AVO2 difference. So when we're talking about pH balance, one of the big roles of the cardiovascular system is to remove that carbon dioxide. Unfortunately for us, when we start accumulating carbon dioxide in aqueous solution or like water solution, it turns into carbonic acid and tends to have a negative effect on pH, meaning it brings pH down, makes the blood or the tissues more acidic. So the way that we get rid of that is actually by exhaling it out of the lungs. And most of you are familiar with when we inhale, we breathe oxygen in and then we exhale a great deal of carbon dioxide out. This is one of the primary mechanisms in which we actually buffer and balance pH in the blood. So very important for that. And then, we also can see as exercise continues, there starts to become a bigger gap between the O2 content in the arteries and the veins. And that's as a result of the muscles actually extracting more oxygen out of the blood. So we see a bigger difference in between the two, which is kind of unique. So when we actually start to see larger increases in 
what we call AVO2 diff, right, as a result of the oxygen that's inside the muscle being used up and now having to extract more from the blood, we typically see increases in respiration as well to accommodate that new demand, right? We also know, as we already mentioned, cardiovascular system is used for delivery of nutrients and removal of waste. So we'll see increases in, during exercise in things like uh, carbohydrate in the bloodstream, either to maintain blood glucose levels or to be picked up for oxidation inside the muscle itself. We can also see in, in long-term, kind of like two hours plus exercise conditions, increases in circulating free fatty acids that can be used and shuttled in the blood and then eventually make their way into the muscle to be used for cellular respiration. Really, really cool. And as we already mentioned, accumulating byproducts need to get removed one way, shape, or form, and they tend to accumulate more and more and more during high intensity and voluminous exercise. So we see a bigger reliance on the cardiovascular system to start removing those waste products, especially things like car uh, carbon dioxide. No surprise, we already mentioned delivery of chemical messengers. So now we can actually see hormones during exercise playing a huge role in regulating a lot of our different homeostatic processes. One of which that you'll learn more about later is what we call bio, excuse me, bioenergetics, which is how our body uses different energy substrates to produce work and produce movement, right? Much of this is actually governed by our endocrine system. And our endocrine system operates by using chemical messengers which travel through the bloodstream. So the blood is responsible for kind of having, it's kind of like the, uh, the UPS for our body, right? Where we have a message that needs to get sent to a different tissue. We send it through the mail system. It eventually makes its way to that other tissue through the blood. And that's how hormones generally work. And then, as we already mentioned, maintenance of blood glucose during exercise, very, very important. You're your nervous system, particularly your brain, only, well, not only, but really, really preferentially operates on glucose and blood glucose, therefore, is very, very tightly regulated. And we see a lots and lots of negative feedback occurring during exercise to maintain a certain level of blood glucose at all times. We don't like our blood glucose getting out of its optimal range. We'll see lots and lots and lots of homeostatic control of the blood glucose levels. Make sense? All right. So let's go on to the next one. The next system we want to talk about is the respiratory system. Now, a lot of people tend to think of these and the, this and the cardiovascular system kind of hand in hand. And it makes sense because they do definitely work in conjunction with each other, but they are also distinct at the same time. So the respiratory system does work in conjunction with the cardiovascular system to effectively deliver oxygen to all tissues and remove carbon dioxide like we already mentioned. So we have four main processes that occur through the respiratory system. The first one is pulmonary ventilation, which is just the act of breathing and doing kind of large scale gas exchange where we're actually bringing in and exhaling gas, atmospheric gas into the body. We have pulmonary diffusion. This is where we actually see gas exchange occurring inside the lungs and at the, uh, the blood level where we have the alveoli and the capillaries interacting and exchanging gas across those tissues. Eventually, once we have that nice gas exchange occurring, we're gonna transport O2 and that oxygenated blood to the rest of the body and vice versa, we're gonna get rid of that carbon dioxide and do the gas exchange in the lungs so we can breathe out that carbon dioxide waste. And then last but not least, we have capillary diffusion, which is when we're actually going to be extracting oxygen from the blood to be used in things like the working tissues and in our case the working skeletal muscle right so let's move on to the next one and talk about these a little bit here we see a nice chart that i got from one of the human kinetics books really really great diagram of kind of a gross scale and a finite scale of what a respiratory system looks like so we breathe in air either through our nasal cavity or through the mouth we make our way down into the trachea where it goes into the bronchi those branch out into multiple more bronchi until eventually we make our way down to the alveolar level and here we we can see a nice depiction of gas exchange occurring at the alveolar level where we have veins bringing that um, deoxygenated blood they exchange at the alveoli and then we can see that rich arterial blood or uh, i had that uh, vice versa sorry then we can see the nice arterial blood eventually making its way back out into the body so this is where we see that gas exchange occurring and i really like this diagram it's a really nice depiction of how this process works so take a look at this if you're not familiar with some of this stuff really really neat let's go on to the next slide so again this is just kind of a reiteration of what i already just said when we inspire we breathe in it goes through on our mouth or through our nose and it makes its way down. This occurs through contraction of the diaphragm muscle, which is deep inside your trunk, and then from the external intercostal muscles. The way this works is essentially these muscles contract and what this does is it actually increases the volume inside your trunk and particularly inside your thoracic cavity, right? 
what we see here is now we had some amount of gas, some amount of pressure inside this cavity. And what I have done by actually expanding it out, I've actually decreased the pressure inside this cavity simply by increasing the volume. So as a result, what we get is passive air flow moving in to the lungs as a result of this change in pressure. So I've changed the volume of the chamber, right, which then changes the pressure inside the chamber, and now we've actually generated a pressure gradient between what's inside the lungs and what's inside the atmosphere. So by expanding my rib cage out and my sternum out, I'm increasing the volume in my lungs. Unfortunately, that decreases the pressure, but that's a good thing because that's actually creating a pressure gradient between me and the external environment, and then air will, and not just air, but gas will pass passively through, and that's the whole process of breathing. Nothing too crazy there. So lots of physics and partial pressure laws going into a, a application here, right? Now, when we exhale, this is mostly a passive process. And so when we actually let the air come back out, it's largely as a result of us just relaxing our inspiratory muscles. There are some differences, which you're gonna learn about later on, doing a forced exhalation, where you actually have to really, really push the air out. But for the most part, we do have some active inspiratory muscles that cause the chambers to expand. And then when we want to exhale, we do it mostly passively just by relaxing those muscles. We can do forced expiration, it's just a different circumstance. Make sense? All right, let's go on to the next one. So, inspired air goes in through the nose or through the mouth. It makes its way into the trachea where it then reaches the two primary bronchi and then they kind of branch out. And then essentially we see that gas moving through a series of different bronchi and then eventually leading to bronchioles and then eventually leading to the smaller exchange surface called the alveoli. So we know that the capillaries surround the alveoli and allow that oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange to occur, right? So this is kind of the articulating surface where we have blood and the lungs interacting, and this is where we actually exchange gas. So it's at the alveoli, which is really, really neat. The way that this works is very similar to what we learned in some of the previous lectures about um, active and passive uh, transport. So for the gas to exchange between the alveoli and the blood, there has to be a pressure gradient, which is very, very similar to what we talked about before with concentration gradients. Remember before we talked about diffusion and osmosis and we said in order for things to flow passively, there has to be a difference. There has to be a high concentration and a low concentration. This is virtually that same idea. It's technically not the same thing, but for our purposes, if we can kind of use that synonymously, it's not technically, but it it's very, very similar. So in this case, what we have is a pressure gradient, not necessarily a concentration gradient, which again, operates mostly the same way. So in this case, in order for carbon dioxide to leave, in order for oxygen to enter, there has to be a difference between what is in the blood and essentially what is in the atmosphere, or more specifically, what is in the alveoli. So in order for us to bring in blood, uh, oxygen to that deoxygenated blood, there has to be more oxygen available than what's actually inside the bloodstream. And the same applies for carbon dioxide. If we want to unload carbon dioxide from the blood, we have to have a high concentration or high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in our blood and relatively low in the alveoli and the atmosphere. And that's how we're gonna unload that carbon dioxide. So same idea applies for both, not only oxygen, but for carbon dioxide as well. We're gonna get a nice graph of this coming up on the next slide. Ah, another good one from the human kinetics people. They make really great figures. I love it, I love it. I wanna give them as much cred here as possible. So here we can see kind of what this looks like and we actually have some numbers we can play around with and we don't need to make this too mathy. But essentially what we have, right, is we have oxygenated blood. It makes its way to the body, to the working tissues. What we find is that that oxygenated blood has a nice high partial pressure of oxygen, which is great. When we get to the working muscles, for example, when we start doing exercise, we have some stored oxygen that's just kind of hanging out locally in the tissue. When we start doing some exercise, we burn that up right away through cellular respiration. So our energy generating processes start using up the available oxygen within the tissue. So now, as that blood starts making its way to the working muscle, we've actually created a pressure gradient between the blood and the working muscle. So I have this oxygen rich blood that's flowing around and I have this muscle tissue which has used up its resting supply of oxygen. So now I have a high concentration here, a low concentration here. What we're gonna see is actually diffusion occurring across and now we're gonna start extracting oxygen from the blood because it has a high concentration into the muscle, right? 
So that's why we do that because there's a pressure gradient. So then after the muscle starts sucking out some of the O2 from the blood and probably pumping it full of carbon dioxide because it's been doing uh, energy production and carbon dioxide is a waste product of that. Now we'll actually start to see that blood flowing into the veins. Now the pressure of oxygen has gone down and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide has gone up. That's gonna make its way eventually back into the, uh, the veins and all the way up to the heart where it's gonna go gas exchange in the lungs and then what do we see? We actually see a pressure gradient between oxygen and the alveoli in the, the excuse me, in the veins and in the alveoli. And in this case, you can see a partial pressure of 105 versus 40. The, don't worry about the numbers too much here. It's just an example. Same thing applies for carbon dioxide. We see a partial pressure gradient there of 46 versus 40. So what we're going to see in the capillaries and in the alveoli is this gas exchange as a result of these pressure gradients. And so then we say, okay, well, I'm tapped out of oxygen, I'm gonna pull oxygen in, and I have all this excessive carbon dioxide, I'm gonna blow that out. And so and then I've kind of reached a more normal homeostatic level of these things in my blood, then it circulates back through, and then goes back to whatever tissues needs to use it. So that's kind of the basis of how that works, and that's why we breathe, make sense? All right, I really like this diagram. Let's go on to the next one. So. The respiratory system, cardiovascular system play a huge role in regulating homeostasis at rest and during exercise conditions. One of the other systems that's really, really noteworthy in this regulation is the endocrine system and something we've already talked about a little bit. The endocrine system is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest internal monitors of homeostasis and one of the biggest regulators of various homeostatic processes. And it does that through the release of hormones, which are generally proteins that act on specific cells to do specific things. So it's pretty neat. This discussion can be expansive. We're gonna keep it relatively simple because you're gonna learn more and more about this as you study exercise physiology. We're just gonna do a nice, quick, easy overview for this one. So the endocrine system integrates virtually all other body systems at rest and during exercise conditions. So it's not just one thing, it really incorporates the entire body. So we typically see hormones being released as a use, uh, excuse me, as a homeostatic regulator using negative feedback, meaning something unfavorable has changed. We have picked up on it. The body will start releasing hormones to do negative feedback to try and change, uh, make a change opposing the negative change that has occurred, right? So essentially, negative feedback says, hey, this is happening. I'm going to try and squash that so we go back to our normal homeostatic range for whatever variable we're looking at. So hormones typically do that through pulsatile release and negative feedback, meaning we start picking up on these changes that are unfavorable and we start kind of pulsatily sending hormones out into the bloodstream. So we don't see like a continuous steady stream release of hormones. It's kind of like bam, rest, bam, rest, more pulsatile action, right? And that's typically what we see with negative feedback anyway. So one of the problems that we see with hormones is that they're not kind of an end-all be-all solution. One of the things that are very, very specific for hormones is that there has to be a hormone-specific cell receptor at the surface of whatever tissue we want the hormone to act on. So we could be sending cortisol, insulin, epinephrine, norepinephrine through the bloodstream. But unfortunately, if they don't have a specific cell receptor on the tissue that we want to act on, it's not gonna do anything. So there is a specific hormone cell receptor for any given hormone on the surface of various cells within any given organ or tissue, right? So it has to actually have a specific cell receptor. So you can think of like circle square uh, triangle game, like when you're a little kid, right? So the triangle's floating through, it has to hit the triangle on the cell, otherwise it will not act. And we have a really nice diagram on the next slide here. And I know if you've watched the other video, we already talked about hormones a little bit, but I really like, this is another Human Connects, really, really nice job on this diagram. So we see, okay, there are some steroid uh, hormone risk that is floating around, the hormone binds to some specific receptor at the cell surface, which then allows it to act out, produce an mRNA, and then get the protein generating the response that we want. So. We can talk about this a little bit more later on in other classes, but for now, this is just kind of the quick and dirty version of how this works. So really, really nice. I like that figure a lot. Thank you very much. Next slide. So we know that hormones regulate a variety of systems relating to exercise and recovery as well. So we usually think of hormones, and uh, I think most commonly we think of like stress responses. We think of bioenergetic regulation, but actually regulates more than a few things, right? So obviously substrate level metabolism, no brainer, most people are familiar with that. It does regulate stress responses and it does regulate kind of recovery anabolism responses, but it also plays a big role in regulating things like fluid and electrolyte balance as well as hunger and satiety. So again, 
The endocrine system regulates virtually all body systems and incorporates them together through primarily negative feedback. So if we look on the next couple slides, we have a whole bunch of examples. Now, this is not inclusive by any means. This is just some that I picked out that I thought would be useful for you to see, right? So typically, what are some ones that are we are particularly um, concerned with with exercise and nutrition and recovery stuff. Well, for example, if we look at the thyroid gland, it produces thyroxine, which is T3 and T4. This acts on all organs, right? And it's something that will increase the body's metabolic rate, right? Other things that are important, if we look at the adrenal cortex, it can secrete cortisol, which will act on most cells. And cortisol is one of our primary stress hormones. It will start increasing catabolism, breakdown of things, generally for energy. And unfortunately for us, that also includes things like proteins, which could affect skeletal muscles, things like that, right? So, excuse me, again, not all inclusive by any means. We can do the next slide and we see some more examples. If we look at the pancreas, the pancreas is kind of an interesting one. We can actually see it releases insulin and glucagon through different cells. Insulin acts on all cells to have a very anabolic effect. Insulin is kind of like the vacuum cleaner hormone. It starts sucking things up and uses them to build things up for storage or for structure. So we actually see glucose has an effect on lowering blood glucose. Like if blood glucose gets out of its optimal range too high, insulin gets released and actually starts pulling that blood glucose out and then can be stored in the liver or in the muscle as glycogen or potentially as fat in some cases if we're getting too much and our glycogen stores are nice and full. It can also affect things like amino acids build up into proteins and it can affect things like storing uh, increases amounts of fat, right? Whereas glucagon on the other hand kind of has the opposing effect where, where sometimes we don't have enough blood glucose and we actually need to start breaking things down to try and pump our blood glucose back up. So we'll actually see it increases blood glucose typically through uh, breaking things down like glycogenolysis, lipolysis, or proteolysis by breaking down other things, carbs, fats, proteins, to start increasing blood glucose as much as we can within our optimal range. So again, these are just some, by all, not all inclusive by all means, and you're going to be learning more and more about hormones. So I would say take a look at the ones on the tables that I listed. Be vaguely familiar with what they are and what they do, and that will make a lot more sense later on when you get deeper and deeper into exercise physiology. So again, can't say enough things about the endocrine system, regulates all body systems in an integrated way, generally through negative feedback and chemical messengers, okay? So now we're getting kind of into the meat and potatoes of today's. The first one I wanted to talk about regarding muscle systems is the musculoskeletal system. So I think it's worth differentiating some of these. We could say like skeletal system, we could say muscle system, we could say nervous system. We could really break those down. For our purposes, we're gonna be talking about exercise, nutrition, recovery. So for, for us, we can talk about the muscles and bones being kind of one system because it makes sense in this context. So the skeletal muscle system, is the primary means for us to actually provide structural support for the body so we're not just like a big limp pile of jello or skin right and it provides the basis for all of the human movement that we want to do right so when we're talking about the musculoskeletal system we're essentially talking about all the skeletal muscle we're talking about bones tendons ligaments fascia all the joints that we have like our elbow joint shoulder joint sternum joint right knee joint all that stuff and then any other connective tissues relating to movement so lots and lots of stuff there, lots and lots of muscle and connective tissue. Let's move on to the next one. So there are 206 bones and uh, a varying degree of muscles in the body. Generally, most people will say over 600 within the body. The muscles act by pulling or shortening, right? So muscles don't actually uh, forcibly lengthen. They only forcibly shorten. They can lengthen against resistance, right? They can lengthen while being contracted, but they don't expand out. They only shorten and they pull on tendons and bones in order to generate human movement, right? Hopefully no surprise there. We know that each muscle has its own origin and insertion, and you're gonna learn more and more about this later on, and we don't have to go crazy on this, but the origin is essentially the anchoring point for the muscle that does not move, so we can think of something like a bicep or a quadricep or any, any, any joint and muscle related to it that has an origin, which means basically the lockdown foundational point of the muscle that will not move. And then we have the insertion, which is where it is acting on the articulating surface that we want to move. And the insertion will move in the direction generally of shortening of the muscle, right? So if we are looking at a bicep curl or something like that, and we know the insertion is down here and you're gonna catch me on the spot. I don't always remember all the origins and insertions because it's really long and expansive and you gotta look it up every now and again, right? So we know that for the elbow joint, the insertion is actually gonna be moving in the direction of shortening, right? In this case, whereas the origin, which is somewhere up here, I believe on the humerus or the, uh, 
uh, maybe proximal to the scapula, but it's up on the humerus, right? It's not going anywhere. That's staying exactly where it started, whereas the insertion is gonna move in the direction of shortening, right? So the origin stays where it is, the insertion moves around as the muscle shortens. Nothing crazy there. So we know that the muscles are attached to tendons, which then attach to bones. We also know that bones can be attached uh, to each other through ligaments. So when we're talking about muscle and bone interaction, there's an intermediate tendon in there. We can have bone and uh, bone interaction and the intermediate there is a ligament. Both are made of collagen fibers and operate on very, very similar levels. So let's go on to the next slide. So here's just an example of what we were talking about here, right? Here's an example on the left. We have an elbow joint and we can see the biceps brachii. We can see the origin and the insertion. We can see where the tendons interact with the actual biceps muscle and how it originates up there. And we can actually see the same thing down here on the insertion where on the, uh, on the radius, there's that nice tendon in between. And then in the elbow joint, which is not necessarily depicted here, we can also see there's different ligaments that hold the elbow joint together, other tendons involved. And another example here on the right is the uh, knee joint. And this one's a really nice example because we can see at the top we have the quadriceps and then we have the patellar tendon attaching the quadriceps to the patella. So we have a muscle to bone interaction. And then over here we actually um, can see a number of other ligaments, right? Most of us are familiar with a lot of these, especially if you had a sports injury before, where we can actually see how the knee joint is held together with bone on bone interactions with ligaments. So you'll learn more and more about that stuff later on. Just two examples that I think really illustrate what we're talking about. Okay, on to the next one. So it's hard to talk about movement, muscles, bones interacting with each other without addressing the nervous system. So the next one we're gonna talk about is kind of the neuromuscular system. So we have the skeletal muscle system, which is like muscle and bone interaction. Now we're gonna just touch on, <clears throat> excuse me, the neuromuscular system, which is how nerves and muscles interact, right? So in order for us to generate human movement, we have to have pulling or activating of muscles on bones. But in order for that muscle to actually contract and generate tension and force, it has to be electrically stimulated first by a nerve. And the word we use for that is innervation. So it has to be innervated by a nerve, meaning it has to be electrically stimulated in order to actually contract. So the neuromuscular system is generally comprised of skeletal muscle, which we've already talked about, motor neurons, and the neuromuscular junction in which they interact. So the neuromuscular system provides all the stimulation that we need for both voluntary movement, which is like when we want to actually move around and do exercise and pick things up and chug a beer, all that stuff, but as well as involuntary movement, which could be like reflex responses where you touch something and you're like, ah, crap, that burned my hand, right? Same thing. It doesn't just happen magically. We still need that neuromuscular system to operate. It just may operate on different levels depending on what, thing, what task or what uh, situation is going on. So let's go on to the next one. So here we have a really, really nice diagram of an alpha motor neuron, and it's innervating multiple muscle fibers here. So a motor unit is the term that we typically use, and a motor unit is a single alpha motor neuron and all of the fibers that it potentially innervates. Now, one thing that's really cool is when you get into the neuromuscular stuff is an alpha motor neuron might actually innervate hundreds of individual muscle fibers. So we're talking about huge, huge amount of branching out, right? It's not just innervating necessarily one muscle fiber, we're talking about hundreds of muscle fibers at a given time, right? So the alpha motor neuron uh, communicates with the muscle at the neuromuscular junction. So again, that alpha motor neuron is gonna be specific to whatever fiber types that it wants to stimulate. And it's gonna stimulate a whole bunch. And what one of the cool training adaptations that we can see in the, over the long term is actually continued branching of that alpha motor neuron, innervating more muscle fibers or different regions within the muscle. Pretty cool stuff. So let's take a look a little bit more closely at what we got over here. The next slide, and I know this one's a doozy because it actually contains not only the neuromuscular junction that we're talking about here, but it also gets into muscle contraction. Here we can see another really nice figure that I like. We can see that neuromuscular junction on the top left. We have the motor neuron, and this is something we already talked about a little bit when we talked about nerves before. We see there's that synaptic cleft. There's acetylcholine receptors at the surface of the muscle cell. We can see the storage vesicle that's about to dump acetylcholine across that membrane, and that will allow that electrical activity to pass from the nerve to the muscle. So, 
What we see then is once we actually see acetylcholine splashing across that neuromuscular junction between the uh, motor neuron and the muscle fiber, then we can see some really crazy things start to happen in the muscle itself. And this is something you'll learn more about later on in exercise physiology. Now that stimulation by the alpha motor neuron actually results in the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum where it was stored in the muscle and that starts spilling out across the cell. Well, that calcium actually allows some of the active binding sites for things like actin, myosin, and the troponin, tropomyosin complex, that allows for the binding sites to actually be opened up and we can actually see the power stroke of muscle contraction occurring. So kind of a huge sequence of events when we really think about it. And I think it's really neat, right? All of that starts usually up top here to make voluntary movement, make its way from the brain to the spinal cord, into the peripheral nervous system, and eventually results in human movement. So it's kind of hard to not mention or give an honorable nod to the neuromuscular system if we're talking about movement, bones, muscles, uh, things like that. So let's go on to the next one. Now, we know that both voluntary and involuntary movement are coordinated through both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So we just want to be clear what we're talking about with those things. The central nervous system is generally defined as the brain and the spinal cord, right? So if everyone, you ever hear anyone say that they have like a weird central nervous system deficiency, you can give them that like stank eye, like, hmm, is your brain working okay? Is your spinal cord working okay? Uh, probably you don't have a problem, right? So. That's generally what we're talking about. We're talking about the central nervous system. Now, a couple cool things that are worth noting about the central nervous system. They control a lot of things, and you can you can look at you can find an anatomy book, biology book, psychology book, and look up all different parts of the brain and spinal cord, right? But for our purposes, a couple things that are noteworthy, they control our sympathetic state, which is our stress state. So when we have fight, flight, freeze, exercise induced stress, things like that. This is going to be primarily controlled through the central nervous system. So when we actually are entering a stressed state for any given reason, that will be controlled by the central nervous system. We also know that on kind of on the polar opposite end, when we move into relaxation, kind of anabolism type states, this is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, uh, or excuse me, controlled by parasympathetic state, controlled by the central nervous system here, right? So when we need to actually relax, uh, unwind, or start triggering anabolism, again, all controlled at the central level. Pretty, pretty neat. And you'll learn more and more about that as we get into exercise physiology. But again, sympathetic stress, parasympathetic relaxation, which is kind of opposite, right? I usually think of like sympathetic as sympathy and like that makes me think of relaxation for or like, or niceness, right? It's kind of the opposite of what you would think. So sympathetic is actually not sympathetic. It's, it's a stress, right? So it's kind of a weird thing. That's the way I remember it. Probably not very helpful, but that's just how I remember those two things. And then the peripheral nervous system is essentially all of the nervous tissue that is not the brain and spinal cord that connects the brain and spinal cord to the rest of the body, right? So essentially anything that is connecting from the nervous, uh, excuse me, from the central nervous system to the periphery, right? The arms, legs, hips, everything else, right? So basically anything that's a nervous structure that's not acting directly on or from the brain or spinal cord, right? So this operates on a massive, 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 massive level. But a couple things that are noteworthy for our discussion are afferent nerves, which are nerves that pick up on things. They're sensory nerves, right? They can be heat, it can be stretch, tension, pressure, pain, um, all sorts of different things like that. And that's gonna relay a signal back through the periphery and back towards the central nervous system that says, hey, I've picked up on a change. Sometimes that change is not a big deal, right? Sometimes it is a big deal, like if you, step on a nail or you touch something that's really hot and you go, ooh, crap, right? Some of those responses are picked up by afferent nerves and then sometimes they don't even actually go up to the brain. Sometimes they're actually regulated at the spinal cord level, which is really neat, right? So sometimes like when you do something that hurts or is really hot or you, like I said, step on a nail or something, you don't even have to actually have that signal go up to the brain. It just stays in the spinal cord and you get a reaction, right? Well, where does that reaction come from? Well, those are efferent nerves, right? Efferent nerves basically control action or response type uh, actions to our afferent signals. So afferent, sensory, efferent, um, like effect, response, action, like doing stuff, movement, actually causes something to happen as a result of the initial stimulus. So that's kind of the way that I remember. Now this is like a very, very quick, dirty version of neuromuscular factors, right? But if you're familiar with these terms going forward, I think you'll be in good shape. All right. Let's move on to the last one that we're gonna talk about today, the digestive system. 
Most of you are very familiar with the digestive system, so we're not going to get too crazy on this one. But for those of you who are not, our digestive system essentially is used to extract biomolecules from foodstuffs and kind of assimilate them like Borg into our body, while at the same time removing waste products, right? So we want to take in food, use that food for energy or for structure or for energy production, right? I think I said energy twice, that's fine. And then we're actually gonna take any of the byproducts from those reactions and excrete them out, right? So the digestive system generally includes, and this is the short list, you can actually have a much more expansive, but for our purposes, this is the list that we're working with, the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, and the small and large intestine. So let's just go through this real quick, nothing too crazy, right? We know that digestion generally starts occurring in the mouth with the teeth and the saliva where we start grinding up food, breaking it down, using the enzymes in the saliva to help start breaking it down on a large scale. Eventually we'll start pushing that food down through the esophagus using peristalsis, which is kind of the uh, wave-like contraction down a tube uh, style organ, right? Like smooth muscle. So we see kind of like the bolus of food entering and it gets kind of pushed like a wave all the way down and we call it peristalsis. So once we've chewed it up, right, we push it down through the esophagus and then the stomach actually does a very similar idea of a peristalsis, it starts churning up that food. It has digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid where now we've kind of had a macro breakdown and now we're starting kind of our micro breakdown of the food where we had big food, we turned it into little food and now we're taking that little food and turning it into like molecular food at that point, right? So eventually, Roughly around two hours later, we start emptying the stomach and we release that bolus of now pasty food type substance into the small intestine. The small intestine is kind of where the majority of the work takes place. So the small intestine generally absorbs proteins, carbs, fats, vitamins, micronutrients, things like that. Any remaining material will make its way into the large intestine, which primarily absorb, uh, excuse me, absorbs water. Once all the usable materials have been extracted out, any solid waste is then removed through the process of defecation, which is pooping. You like it? Poop made its way onto this one. Very, very nice. So that's kind of the quick overview of some of the major systems that you guys should be familiar with. Hopefully you guys aren't rolling your eyes too much, but I know a lot of people haven't taken anatomy, biology, even things like some physics classes, probably since high school. So this is really just meant for you guys to be familiar with some of these terms and not be totally scared if somebody starts dropping knowledge bombs and you're like, I have no idea what that word meant or what these terms are, just meant to get you up to speed. Hopefully you guys found this little review course helpful. I had fun putting it together and I hope you enjoy all the really cool and uh, awesome things that are coming up at RP Plus and RPU. This is again, Dr. James Hoffman signing off for now and I hope to see you guys in a later, more challenging course.